Hi everyone, before we get started with our message, I just wanted to acknowledge that this weekend is Memorial Day weekend, a time when we just get to pause and reflect on the soldiers that actually gave the greatest sacrifice and lost their life and fight for our country. I just want to extend a giant thank you from Court Street, uh, a very grateful church and a great, very grateful nation for that sacrifice. And if you are a family who has lost somebody uh, in those heroic acts, also just wanted to say a big thank you as well for your sacrifice. All right, I wanted to get into this message uh, this weekend. Um, my name is Becca Riddle, this is Court Street Christian Church, and I'm so glad that you're joining us. Um, we're talking about, in the middle of a sermon series called Imagine If, where we're actually looking back at Jesus' parables that he taught and understanding them, even sometimes in a fresh new way for the first time. Um, and while we're doing that, we're really wanting to become really intelligent readers of them and looking at things like context and looking at things like what was his original audience thinking. And we're diving into those things so that we can really understand the meaning of the parable and then we get to turn it into significance in our own life. And so as we're looking today, I specifically wanted to highlight historical context and why it is so important. So if you can imagine with me, imagine with me that a thousand years from now, a thousand years from now, I have a relative who wants to know some more information about me and is digging up some stuff and they find they're able to like plug in an old computer into a flex capacitor or something. I don't know what they've got then. And they find an old Facebook post of mine. Okay, so let's read what, what they're reading. Okay, they read something like this. This Christmas, I hosted a white elephant party. I ended up with a package of toilet paper and 32 ounces of hand sanitizer. Best gift ever. Hashtag 2020. Okay, so right now in our context and in our culture, we can read that post on Facebook and we understand it completely. We know what a white elephant gift is. We understand that in 2020 we had a big shortage of toilet paper and hand sanitizer. And we also, well, most of us understand what a hashtag is. But imagine my relative a thousand years from now reading this information and the curiosity that it would spark and the wonder and really it would spark something in their imagination that had nothing to do with what I really was presenting here. I mean, a white elephant party? What, what would she imagine? Like that I was some like wealthy aristocrat who collected like albino elephants and like had a party just for them to come to. I mean, can you imagine her confusion and and what she collects toilet paper? She's really excited about toilet paper. That's that's really that's an odd thing. All right, I'll write that down in her memoir that she collected toilet paper. I mean, can you imagine the the rabbit trail that this woman, this poor woman, would go on trying to find out information about me? So that's just a light-hearted way, so that we can look at how important it is that we understand historical context when we're looking at something as ancient as Jesus's words 2,000 years ago. So we're gonna be exploring that and so much more today as we uh, tear off another parable. I have to tell you that this parable is probably one of my favorites. I would actually say it is my favorite one. It's been something that has turned in my heart and has done a mighty work in me, so I'm so excited to present it to you today. And one of the things that it has in it is an element that Jesus used all the time, and that was something that his audience could connect to, something that they would really understand. And this one is full of family drama and sibling rivalry. Now, you might be a parent right now and sibling rivalry is happening right now in the room right next to you. It's very alive and well. Um, if you are a sibling, you might just remember the tension that, that sometimes that can cause. What it stirred up in me was a story that I remember um, from my childhood. I grew up in a blended home and I had a stepbrother who was actually just eight months younger than me. And so you add step family and sibling rivalry and the layers just keep getting of the complexity, right? So my stepbrother, um, 
he was having a lot of trouble in middle school. He was absent all the time. He seemed to be getting in trouble a lot. And um, he wasn't even really fun to be around because he had such a rebellious nature. Well, it was my weekend to go visit my dad. And I had overheard a conversation that I don't think anybody wanted me to hear. And that was that they were paying my stepbrother for good grades. Paying him real cash money for good grades. Now listen, good grades did not come easy to me. I worked hard for them. And that I found out that my little brother was getting paid to go to school and have good grades, I was floored. I was, I was completely angry. All of those feelings came up of just jealousy and just indignant. And I, I, I think I remember the quote that I gave my, my dad. It was that, that teenager just like, I just think I was like, you know that quote that they give that has says so much meaning, just this little pfft. like who dare how dare you? How would you how could you treat them different than me? So this is my story of sibling rivalry. And so I'm wondering if you can connect with something like that. Do you have a story like that? And can you guess what parable we're gonna be talking about today? Well, the parable is known to many as the prodigal son, the prodigal son. And before I jump into this story, I just want to set it up just a little bit. This story is found in Luke, and Jesus is talking to a crowd that is comprised of some different groups of people. He actually names a few. He has some Pharisees and some scribes, and he has some sinners and some tax collectors. These two very different groups that seem to be at odds with each other in their culture. And he's addressing something because he's been hearing some whispers. He's been hearing some whispers that the Pharisees are very angry and puzzled at why Jesus, a rabbi, a teacher of the law, would be having dinner with sinners and tax collectors. And so Jesus hears this and he starts spouting out a trilogy of parables. The first one is the parable of the lost sheep. The second is the parable of the lost coin. And then he ends it with a grand finale of the parable of the prodigal son. Now we're going to really slow down here, church. Even if you feel like you're familiar with this, I just want you to, to listen to this with fresh eyes. And now because we know that historical context is so important to understanding the meaning of things, I'm going to do my very best to interject some historical context into the story so that you can be just like those first listeners that Jesus told this story to. So are you ready? This is found, like I said, in Luke 15. And this is the story that Jesus told. There was a man who had two sons. I have to stop right there. We didn't get very far, did we, before I wanted to add something in. There, once, there was a man with two sons. Now, why I wanted to draw your attention to this is because the title of this parable is the parable of the prodigal son. But right here, Jesus is telling us who the main character of this parable is. The parable is a man, a man who had two sons. I want you to keep that in the back of your minds. And let's keep reading here. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. And so he divided his property between them. I just have to tell you, there's some context here you have to know. Because if Jesus' audience is listening to this, this would have been shocking. This would have been shocking that as the father is still living, the younger son, the son who has less rights than the older son, would go to the father and ask for his share of his inheritance before the father is even dead. There would have probably been a little bit of a, even a gasp in the crowd. This was unheard of. It was almost as if this younger son was saying, I wish you were dead right now so that I could go on and live. So let's keep reading here. It says this, 
Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had and he set off for a distant country and there he squandered his wealth on wild living. Oh man, you can imagine, you can imagine right now that everyone in the crowd, most people in the crowd, they're just tisk tisk tisk. How could he do it? Squander all of his wealth in that short period of time? And there are probably some people in the crowd who were like, yep, been there, done that. There's both of these reactions happening in the hearts of people. I want to look here just for a moment. We've got quite a picture of this younger son. We've got quite a picture of what's happening in his life. And so I want you just to notice this, that the younger son values personal satisfaction over a relationship with his father. The younger son values personal satisfaction over relationship with his father. Let's keep reading on the story. After he spent everything, there was a famine in the whole country, and he began to be in need. So he went and he hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him into the fields to feed pigs. Okay, got to stop again. Because you need to understand that in this culture, pigs had quite a significance. They were absolutely despised in the Jewish culture. They were despised because the, this animal and this, this particular uh, culture, it was off limits for them. It was off limits because it was considered unclean. It was associated with, with foreigners so that his audience heard that this younger son not only took his father's money, his portion early, he went off and he squandered it. And then to make a living, he actually fed and took care of pigs. Oh, they were disgusted. They couldn't believe this story couldn't get any worse. It couldn't get any worse. The story continues here. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. And when he came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have food to spare? And here I am starving to death. I will set out and I'm going to go back to my father and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you and I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. And so he got up and he went to his father. So now listen, this kid, he's making a plan. He's making a plan of how he's going to make amends. And now we're wondering, how is the father going to respond? And his audience is wondering, what is it going to be like? Because if you were a person, one of Jesus' first audiences hearing this, you would have a pretty good idea of what was going to happen next. Either because you knew what fathers of the time would do. You knew how harsh that this was going to come. You knew that he was going to get the smack down. Either that or you had actually even lived a similar story and you were actually frightened of what was going to become. Maybe this is triggering some fear in you. And so let's read. Let's keep reading here. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and he was filled with what? Rage, I'm sure, that the, their audience was thinking. He was filled with rage, of course. Ah, that's not the answer. Maybe they thought, maybe, maybe he'll be filled with judgment. He would have so much right just to feel so, just judgment. He was going to need to condemn his son for what he did. But what does the text say? The text actually says this. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and he was filled with compassion. He was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son. He threw his arms around him and he kissed him. Oh my gosh, can you imagine the crowd when they heard this reaction that the father was filled with? with compassion, that he ran to him, that he had no emotional restraint. He did everything he could to welcome his son back home. His son, overwhelmed, responds like this. He says this, the son said to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and against you, and I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father just keeps going. 
he has this um, he has this way where he almost cuts off his son. He doesn't even want to hear it. He's just so glad his son is back. It says in verse 22, but the father said to his servants, quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. And I love this word quick. There's no hesitation in the father's heart. And the best robe, that would have probably been his own robe. Put it on the back of my son. It says this too, put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Now the context of this, a ring back in first century, each family would have had its own unique signet ring. They would use that to sign their name on official documents or seal a precious letter um, to make sure that they knew what household it came from. By placing that ring on his finger, the son was giving him all the rights and the privileges of being a part of his family and being a son again. The father goes on to say, bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. Now, a, a, a fattened calf during that time, that would have been un, so unusual to be able to eat a delicacy like that. And to have a celebration, it would have been a huge cost. It would have been reserved for the greatest, the greatest of victories. And here he's throwing a party for his son. He says this, this is why I'm doing it in verse 24. For the son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. Now this big party is happening. And this might be a really good place for Jesus just to stop the story and let people just rejoice in the story. But remember This is a story about a man who had two sons. And the rest of the story is about the older. Let's read in verse 25. Meanwhile, the older son was in the field. And when he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. And so he called one of the servants and he asked him what was going on. Your brother has come home, he replied. And your father has killed the fattened calf because he has come back safe and sound. Now you can use your imagination here. Put yourself in the older brother's shoes. You've been out working in the field. You start to hear music and smell barbecue. You come in asking questions and you find out that your screwed up, screwed up little brother has come home after squandering part of your inheritance, leaving you with the work, and he's come home, and your dad's response was to throw him a party. Now, honestly, like, put yourself in the older brother's shoes. I mean, can you imagine what he was thinking? Can you imagine that he's just thinking, oh, good, fantastic. He goes off. He squanders the family's wealth. He disrespects our family name. And he comes home to a feast. Like I can imagine his heartache and his confusion. Let's read this. Let's read what the text says. Verse 28. The older brother became angry and he refused to go in. So now listen to this. So the father went out and pleaded with him. Notice this. The father leaves the party to go and talk with the older son. And the son takes this opportunity to tell his father what he really thinks of all of it, of all of the injustice. He says this in verse 29. But he answered his father, look, all these years I've been slaving for you and I've never disobeyed your orders, yet you never gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. Are you picking up what he's putting down here? He is so angry. He is so jealous. He cannot believe that this is the response. And then in verse 30, but when this son of yours who has squandered your property with prostitutes, comes home, you kill the fattened calf for him. So think about this. Think about this. Think about this unveiling of the older brother's heart. And as we're thinking about what he is valuing, 
Think about this, that the older son values status and accolades over relationship with the father. He is really saying, I've worked this. I've earned this. I need this status in my life. And how dare you give him a celebration when I would like a celebration? So he's valuing something, status and accolades over relationship with the father. Let's see how he responds. Verse 31, my son, the father says, even just acknowledging that relationship, my son, you are always with me and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours, reestablishing the relationship, reminding him this is your brother, this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So then Jesus must have them all in the palm of his hand. And they are all just hungry for the end, for the conclusion of this story. What happens? Inquiring minds want to know, did he stick to his guns and protest the party because he wasn't going to be part of all of that injustice? Did the little brother come out and beg for forgiveness of the older brother? And then they walk into the party um, giving each other little noogies. Did the father like regret his, how he treated the younger brother and, and cast him out again? We want to know what happened. But in the great storytelling fashion of Jesus, he doesn't give us that information. He leaves us and he leaves our brains activated. He leaves the story swirling in our minds, wondering what happened, giving us an opportunity to work out the story on our own. He's a genius storyteller. We can deduce this. The father in the story seems to just be over the top loving to his very different sons. He seems to be a father that allows free will and a father that doesn't force control. And his uh, sons, he doesn't force any kind of control over his son's relationship with him. He seems to have a longing for his sons and it, and it doesn't require payback to be in his presence. The father seems to think that a celebration over retribution is the way you welcome a wild son home. This is just a beautiful parable that does get your imagination swirling. And those two characters of the older brother and the younger brother, they so wonderfully and masterfully represent humanity and our attempts at reaching um, our own satisfaction and even our relationship with God. It is a masterpiece of a story. And so for me, going back and realizing that we have to read this parable in a very practical way by first understanding the historical context so that we can really understand what that first century audience heard and understood, then it can get me centered on how that parable can start having significance in my life. Before I make it about God and me, I need to think about a man, a man who had two very different sons. And I think about siblings, and I think about the complexity of those relationships. And I even think back on my own sibling rivalry experience. And now in my, in my age, and I'm a mom now, and I realize how hard it is to raise very different kids, I have such compassion on my dad, and I have such compassion on my little brother who is really struggling. And I have such understanding now of the desperation that my dad had to try to um, do anything he could to motivate my little brother in finishing middle school. And sadly, part of my story is that my little brother never even entered a day in high school, never even went. 
And so the struggle was real and there was things that I didn't even understand going on in the heart of my little brother that I wish I could go back to my teenage self and have more compassion for and root my dad on as he was trying everything he could to help my little brother. So I start there. I start there with with understanding just the complexity of father and son, relationship, sibling, rivalry. And once I start there, it opens up something about me being able to use my imagination to help figure out my relationship with God and to start seeing him as a loving father. You know, one of the cool things about parables that Jesus was using them as a tool to unveil the kingdom of God and to reveal something about the heart of God that maybe we hadn't understood before. And so I want to ask you this question. I want to ask you this. Jesus reveals that the heart of God is what? Now, I'm not going to fill in this blank for you because that's the beauty of a parable is you do the work. It becomes personal to you. You get to intersect your own life experiences with the parable, with Jesus' teaching, with your relationship with God, and you get to look at that father, and you get to draw your own conclusions. What was Jesus saying about the heart of God that that father revealed in the parable? Now listen, if this parable was hard to hear at times or confusing or had some surprising twist to it, then that parable was working on you. If the parable was having a hard time landing with you and you were just trying to figure out, like, am I the older brother and the younger brother? Now listen, the parable is working on you. Give it some time. If you were having, um, imagining that this parable um, gave you some glimpses of yourself and you could really identify with, with one character or the other and it really actually kind of satisfied something about your story, seeing it in their story, then I want you to know that the parable is working on you. And it's so amazing that 2,000 years later, this parable is still stirring up goodness and is revealing something to us about the heart of God. I'd like to pray for us before we go out into our day, before we pick up the jobs of being parents or paying bills or painting the house or whatever you have planned for the rest of the day. I'd love just to create a space for you to just be able to sit and reflect on this parable. Let it take root in your heart and see God perhaps in a whole new way. Let's pray together. Father God, um, boy, this has always done a number on me because I've seen myself as both a younger brother, an older brother. I've seen myself struggle trying to meet my own satisfaction and live in the presence of your love. And Lord, what, I've, what I'm learning is that the best life is the with God life, the life where I'm partnering with you and you with me, and our life becomes intertwined and natural, and I'm getting the goodness of seeing the kingdom of God just unveil right before my eyes, and I'm seeing you change my life. I'm seeing you change my jealousy to compassion. I'm seeing you change my hatred and soften it to love. And I love that your word um, is still working in us. The word of the kingdom is still growing in our hearts. May it be so forever and ever. Amen. Thanks for joining us, church. We'll see you next week.